DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents the Second Week Rules for the Discernment of Spirits, an Ignatian Guide to a Greater Discernment of Spirits, with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He's also the author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Venerable Bruno Lanteri, as well as other works focused on aspects of the spiritual life, including Spiritual Consolation, the book on which this series is based. The Second Week Rules for the Discernment of Spirits, an Ignatian Guide to a Greater Discernment of Spirits, with Father Timothy Gallagher. We now continue with Part 2 of Conference Talk 2 with Father Timothy Gallagher. This may be a little bold of me, but as I read the life of St. John Vianney, this um, really model for, uh, for priests and just a, a wonderful, wonderful figure of holiness, we may see something which can shed light on this tactic of the enemy. John Vianney spends 41 years as pastor of this little town of ours, and he's sent there because uh, he's not a very good student. In fact, they had to he had to leave the seminary and get help before he could return to complete the study. So he is sent out to a small, impoverished, uh, largely extinct country parish in a little forgotten town, which is ours. And when he arrives there, the, the parish is in ruins, uh, literally. There are only a handful of people even coming to Mass. Poverty is widespread. Alcoholism is rampant and all the accompanying vice that is part of it. And patiently, over 20 years, the curie of ours, St. John Vianney, prays and weeps and ser- serves his people, and an astounding transformation t- comes. A time comes 20 years later when he stands in the pulpit on a Sunday Mass before a packed church, a refurbished church, packed, and he tells the people, ours is no longer ours. Um, it's really amazing. Um, this man heard for over 30 years spend 16 hours a day in the confessional. I'll just say that a few times in my priesthood, I have spent five consecutive hours in the confessional. You come out pretty worn. It was an ongoing miracle that this man, for 30 years, 30 plus years, would spend 16 hours a day in the confessional as people from all over France came to this parish, so much so that the, uh, they had to create a new transportation line of carriages to accommodate the uh, great numbers of pilgrims, three, uh, three or 400 people would arrive every day. People would wait three days in line to go to confession to this priest. And at the height of the pilgrimages, uh, up to 120,000 people a day were coming to this parish. It was transforming not only, uh, of course, the parish itself, but uh, its influence was felt throughout the entire nation. Now, throughout those years, Consistently, St. John Vianney, as he lived this um, certainly humanly crushing but astoundingly fruitful, spiritually fruitful ministry, never, what never left him was the longing for the contemplative life in a monastery. Uh, so much so that uh, every time the bishop would come in visitation to the parish, he would beg the, the bishop, and this is throughout the 41 years, for permission to leave the parish and go to the monastery. And there were various reasons in this. He never felt adequate um, to the responsibilities of a pastor. Uh, The way he said it was he wanted a chance to go and weep and pray over his poor life, as he called it. And I think something that we can readily understand, here is a man who is living uh, a physically and emotionally crushing burden day after day, and the longing in his heart to be freed from that so that he can immerse himself in prayer and communion with the God whom he so deeply loves. But year after year, uh, his, none of his bishops throughout those years ever recognized God's will in that attraction to the monastery. In fact, the priest who was sent to help him when the, the work grew so much um, witnessed that uh, John Vianney knew himself that there was a temptation in this. Uh, so much so, however, that even two weeks before his, uh, his death, as the bishop said in his homily for his funeral, the curie of ours had asked him one more time yet to be allowed to go to, to the monastery. Three times over those 41 years, he actually did leave the parish with the purpose of entering the monastery. But each time, 
the, uh, the, the call of his people whom he loved so deeply, or the bishop uh, caused him to return. Now, we have a person in the second spiritual situation, clearly. This is a man of um, just deep, deep holiness, who is doing enormous good in the church in his service as pastor of this parish, and who is experiencing spiritual consolation, rich, abundant, constant spiritual consolation at the thought of a very good and holy thing, which is the life of penance and prayer in the, uh, in the monastery. Was that a call from God? As I say, none of his bishops ever recognized it as a call from God. And on some deep level, he himself always knew that it was a temptation. Or was it, as seems very likely, the enemy tempting under the appearance of good? And here, as is very evident, the stakes are very high. Literally hundreds of thousands of people will be deprived of a wonderful help that they're receiving through his active priestly ministry in the parish if he leaves that for the sake of a very good thing, which is a monastic life. Clearly, there will be um, a dramatic diminishment of the service of God's people if he leaves parish work for the sake of contemplative life. And one thing to note here is the persistent quality of these thoughts throughout all of those 41 years and even up to his death. This, and we'll call it temptation toward this good and holy thing of monastic life never left him, which indicates to us that holiness does not eliminate the need for discernment. I'd say it even increases it because the stakes are higher. The further a person advances in the spiritual life, the more necessary the greater discernment of the second set of rules becomes. So I don't think it's exaggerating to say this discernment is crucial in the life of the church, and a lot depends upon it. As we can see in this case, evidently, as we see in Charles' case, and as we see in Patricia's case. Okay, so that's the issue. That's how the enemy works in the second spiritual situation. All right, what's the answer? How do we discern uh, when we are experiencing this tactic of the enemy? And that is where Ignatius turns now in the remaining seven rules, from rules two through rule eight. Rule eight. So just to, to focus the issue before we move into rule two, when you have a person in the second spiritual situation, and when the enemy may be tempting under the appearance of good, how can we know whether an experience of spiritual consolation with the thoughts that arise from it, is of God or of the enemy. And in Rule 2, Ignatius gives us a first answer to that question. And I'm going to introduce that by looking at some experiences. So we're going to move again in this rule from experience to text. So if you would take in the handout on page 7, you'll have these experiences that we'll go through. And this first is from the diary of Julian Green, died in 1998. Um, an American writer lived much of his life in France, novelist, and really has some lovely things in his diary, um, Catholic. Well, he, what, what he does, he's 41 years old now, and he chronicles in his journal an experience which took place when he was 15. The memory of a winter evening has stuck in my mind more clearly than any other instance. It happened in the pension, so that's the boarding place where he's living at the time, It happened in the pension I tried to describe in The Strange River, one of his novels. My father and I shared the same bedroom. I was in bed. My father was saying his prayers. All of a sudden, I was seized with an unutterable happiness, a happiness of spirit that tore me free from myself. For a few minutes, my soul was completely absorbed in God. With great reverence, obviously, he is experiencing deep and abundant spiritual consolation. I could not have said what was taking place in me, but my thoughts, instead of wandering here and there as they usually did, came to a standstill in a sort of rapture that I have never experienced since. And the very words I used to try to describe the indescribable only served to confuse my memories. And yet this is not so. What lives in my memory is the feeling of deep security, a little of which still remains so many years later. 
the inexpressible peace enjoyed by the soul when it takes shelter under the all-powerful wing of the Lord. So, the young Julian experiences intense and powerful spiritual consolation. And as is evident in the account, it's simply given. Um, He's not praying. uh, He's not even thinking about, about God. He's in bed. His father is elsewhere in the room praying. And it's simply poured out upon him without any effort on his part ahead of time. There is an identifiable an identifiable beginning and end, suddenly. So he knows very clearly when this begins. And he also knows some minutes later when it ends. And he knows that this is special. This is not just an ordinary spiritual experience. And he experiences this as deeply fruitful, even many years later, something of the security that that God is with me, protecting me under his wings. Some of this still remains. Beautiful experience of God's grace in this young man's life. The second is from a Christian brother, uh, Brother Bob. And this is uh, an account probably written by his spiritual director of a meeting of spiritual direction. So Bob may be in the midst of a retreat, or this just may be his ongoing prayer. So, Brother Bob, the other morning I was praying over the story of the woman who washed the feet of Jesus with expensive perfume. I was struck by the extravagance of her love. And the director, this is a good director, simply repeats his final words, the extravagance of her love, which is a way of inviting uh, Brother Bob to say more about this. Yes, nothing was too much for her to do for him. She took the most expensive thing she had and extravagantly poured it out on Jesus' feet. And they spend a few moments. The director helps Bob to say more about this. As Bob says more about this, he is entering more deeply into the grace of the experience. And then the most unexpected thing happened. I was all of a sudden overwhelmed with God's love. It was incredible. The director understands the importance of this and um, uh, feeds this back to, to Brother Bob. Gosh, tell me about it. It was so unexpected and overwhelming. Second time he uses that word overwhelming and extravagant. God just extravagantly poured out his love on me. It was outrageous. I have felt for a long time God's love for me, but this was so extravagant. And the director, uh, who was right there with Bob, um, shares this with him. Wow. God extravagantly poured out his love upon you, inviting him to say more. Yeah, it was totally accepting love, the kind of love that you don't have to do anything to earn. It was more than anything I could ever imagine. I'm still inviting Bob to to share more about this. How did you feel, Bob, being so extravagantly loved by God? I felt so deeply consoled and strengthened. Deeply consoled and strengthened, yes, I felt a deep inner strength, totally accepted by God, confirmed by God in who I am and what I'm about as a Christian brother. So as a part of this wonderful experience of extravagant, overwhelming spiritual consolation, Brother Bob is confirmed in his vocation as a Christian brother and in his service in the church as a Christian brother. I even cried, which I have not done in a long time. I was so moved. God and I were totally one. There was no gap between us. There was no separation between us. We were totally one. The very core of my being was with God. I felt totally accepted by God. God is so pleased with who I am and how I am serving others as a religious. Again, because we're on holy ground, we'll approach this with reverence. Like Julian, Brother Bob experiences intense, powerful spiritual consolation. Now, by contrast with Julian, who is not at all praying or even thinking about spiritual things when the great, when the consolation is given, Brother Bob is praying, but he knows that the disproportion between his prayer and then what suddenly was poured into it um, was so great that he knows that the, the spiritual consolation given him did not come from his efforts, but was simply poured out extravagantly, as he says, upon him. He, like Julian, can identify a moment when this began suddenly. And also, there'll be a lot of warmth and sense of love on the other end, but he will know, too, 
when the grace itself has gently um, comes to a conclusion, leaving its, its warm and blessed fruits. He, and he knows that this is a special experience, overwhelming, extravagant, incredible, that this is not just a simple um, one experience among many. And as with Julian, it is deeply fruitful. He comes out of this experience of spiritual consolation, deeply confirmed in his vocation, in his service in the church, and in the knowledge that God is close to him and loves him. We'll return to The Second Week Rules for the Disturbance of Spirits with Father Timothy Gallagher in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, Tune in, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to The Second Week Rules for the Discernment of Spirits with Father Timothy Gallagher. And let's take a third experience. And this is from one of the early biographies of St. Francis. At this point, the young Francis has uh, abandoned any attempt to find earthly glory through a military career. He has returned to Assisi and is awaiting an indication from the Lord as to what the Lord wants from him. Soon after Francis had returned to Assisi, his companions elected him king of the revels and gave him a free hand to spend what he liked in the preparation of a sumptuous banquet as he had often done on other occasions. After the feast, they left the house and started off singing through the streets. Francis's companions were leading the way and he, holding his wand of office, followed them at a little distance. Instead of singing, he was listening very attentively. So this is the setting. Uh, They're setting off after their meal, um, singing as a group of of friends through the street. Francis holds back. He has a certain distance that separates him from them, and he's not singing. He's simply just listening very attentively. All of a sudden, the Lord touched his heart filling it with such surpassing sweetness that he could neither speak nor move, which is very powerful spiritual consolation, so strong, so powerful that he can't even move. He simply comes to a halt there in the street and would not have been able to speak even 
uh, had someone spoken to him at that time. So he is utterly, utterly filled with, imbued with a powerful, rich, and sweet spiritual consolation. He could only feel and hear this overwhelming sweetness, which detached him so completely from all other physical sensations that, as he said later, had he been cut to pieces on the spot, he could not have moved. When his companions looked around, they saw him in the distance and turned back. To their amazement, he was transformed into another man, and they asked him, what were you thinking of? Why didn't you follow us? Were you thinking of getting married? Francis answered in a clear voice, you are right. I was thinking of wooing the noblest, richest, and most beautiful bride ever seen. His friends laughed at him, saying that he was a fool and did not know what he was saying, but um, he's been transformed in this experience. In reality, he had spoken by a divine inspiration. The bride was none other than that form of true religion which he embraced, the Franciscan life, and which above any other is noble, rich, and beautiful in poverty. The bride he will come to call Lady Poverty. And again, we're on very holy ground here, so we'll approach this with reverence. Like Julian and Brother Bob, Francis experiences a powerful, intense, um, powerful spiritual consolation. It would be hard to find terms to express a more totalizing spiritual consolation than those Francis uses. And as in the other cases, cases, it's not through his effort. Francis is not praying, uh, focused on scripture or anything like this. Uh, he's simply uh, walking through the street in silence, listening. And it is suddenly and abundantly, even overwhelmingly, as he says, poured out upon him. As with the others, there's an identifiable beginning and end. Suddenly, uh, he can very clearly identify the time before from the time when the consolation begins. And it would also, if he were to, you know, to think about it, it's not in the account, but he would also know when um, the consolation would conclude. Who can say however, however many minutes later, leaving, however, a rich, warm, abundant light and grace within him. And Francis knows, like the others, that this is special, overwhelming, and it's deeply fruitful. Through the gift of his consolation, he is transformed into another man, as the, the account tells us, and he is given the seed of what will become his life's vocation, the wooing of the noblest, richest, and so forth bride, and that is Lady Poverty, and what will become the Franciscan life. Now, in all three experiences, a person receives an intense spiritual consolation they are totally embraced by God's love. In all three cases, it is unexpected. There's no prior spiritual activity on the person's part in Julian and Francis' case, or the prior spiritual activity is all out of proportion to what follows, as in Brother Bob's case. And it would be hard to doubt, uh, we really can't doubt in all three cases that God is at work. Certainly these persons do not doubt it, and they experience the abundant fruit of this kind of spiritual consolation. This is the kind of experience Ignatius will talk about in his second rule. So let's read the text of the second rule. We'll read it, and then we'll be going back over it more in depth in our next uh, conference. The second, it is of God our Lord alone to give consolation to the soul without preceding cause. Why? Because it is proper to the creator, that is, only God can do this. It is proper to the creator to enter, go out, and move it, the soul, interiorly, drawing it totally in love of his divine majesty. I say without cause. So in the latter part of the rule, Ignatius has told us only God can give spiritual consolation without a preceding cause. And in the second part of the rule, Ignatius now explains what he means by a preceding cause. I say without cause, that is, without any previous sentiment or knowledge of some object through which such a consolation comes, by means of its, the soul's, acts of understanding and will. So Ignatius is speaking of a, a particular kind of spiritual consolation in the second rule, and this will be a powerful experience of spiritual consolation. 
As Ignatius says, the consolation or through it, God draws the person totally in love of his divine majesty. We see that in Julian, Brother Bob, and Francis. And this kind of consolation is given without a preceding cause. It's simply given, poured out. And we can already we can see that already in the examples that we've cited. All right, so consolation without preceding cause. This kind of consolation, rich consolation, which is simply given to the person without any preceding activity on the person's part beforehand, only God can give this. As Ignatius says, it is of God our Lord alone to give consolation to the soul without preceding cause, because only God can an- enter and work in the soul in this way. Uh, Angels, whether good or bad, uh, none of them can do this. Only God can enter so directly and immediately into the soul to give it this kind of consolation. And so we already have a first answer to the question that faces us in the second spiritual situation described by the second rules. Now, in order to know whether the consolation is in fact this kind of consolation which only God can give, we need to know whether that consolation was, in fact, without a preceding cause. And in order to know whether it was without a preceding cause or not, we need to know clearly what Ignatius means by a preceding cause. And that's where we'll we'll turn when we return to our next conference. You've been listening to The Second Week Rules for the Discernment of Spirits, an Ignatian Guide to a Greater Discernment of Spirits with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download the podcast version of this conference, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. To view Father Gallagher's video presentation of this conference, visit discerninghearts.com or the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for The Second Week Rules for the Discernment of Spirits, an Ignatian Guide to a Greater Discernment of Spirits with Father Timothy Gallagher.